Growing up in a polygamous family, this is what it was like for me, and I'm going to do my best to share my personal experience. So, I hope it makes sense. <laughs> so, first off, right off the bat, I want to get rid of a lot of the stereotypes, typical things that weren't the case for me, personally, because I did not grow up in a house with all of my moms in the same house. <laughs> Do you guys really want to go down that rabbit hole? <laughs> just... Hmm. <laughs> I grew up basically without a dad, right? And so I and I was the oldest boy, so I remember wanting to like be the father figure to my younger brothers and for for example one of the things I want to teach them how to do is to shave and no one taught me how to shave I didn't know how to shave but I wanted to teach them how to shave so what ended up happening is I found these razors inside of our bathroom and I gave one to my little brother and I took one and I just started pretending to shave all over everywhere just whatever and he watched me and started doing the same thing and funny enough, he even took it a step farther and started shaving weird things. Like he, at one point, stuck out his tongue and shaved his tongue. And after we had gone through all of this, trying to shave or pretending to shave, whatever, we realized that we had been cutting ourselves just all over. And we were like bleeding, just blood was everywhere. And my mom came in and saw this, just us in a pool of blood, in a bathtub with cuts and blood all over us. And she starts freaking out and trying to like clean it all up and, and for me she started putting band-aids all over my neck and wherever I cut myself and my little brother looks at her and sticks out his tongue with a big old cut along it and he's like can I get a band-aid on my tongue please? <laughs> I'll never forget just laughing so hard because first of all this is basically my fault I initiated all this I was trying I like convinced him to shave with me we had no idea what we were doing and he ended up cutting himself on the tongue but that's just one of the many weird things I found myself in growing up in a polygamous family. Other things are like the fact that we had so many of us boys packed into one little room. Like I shared a room with five brothers. All five of us were crammed in one little room that like we could not fit all the beds in there. So what we had to do is we had to stack them three high. We had three high bunk beds. You could literally go into the top one and jump from that one to the other bunk bed and then from that one to the lower bunk bed and just like, it was a jungle gym. <laughs> it was crazy because we were just crammed in there like little sardines. And we had so many clothes on the floor that like you would just fall and just land in a pile of clothes. So it wasn't that bad. <laughs> we just had fun with it. Another interesting thing about growing up in a polygamous household is the fact that there's lots of us kids but we weren't all there at once my mom was popping us out like hotcakes and I remember it just kinda got to this normalized thing where I would sit outside of her like bedroom door and just wait for one of my younger siblings to come into this world and the, t the one that I remember the most was when one of my younger sisters was being born and I was just sitting outside of the door and my dad opened up the door and he hands me this this like bowl filled with blood <laughs> he's like go bury this in the backyard and bring me the bowl back if you have any questions just don't ask <laughs> I was like, what the freak I took this bowl filled with blood I wobbled it out to the backyard <laughs> probably spilling on the way and I just dug a hole and buried it all in the backyard and I remember like so many things were going through my mind but I had no idea what to think of it I was just carrying this bowl of blood and it was just really weird I'll never forget that that was a weird moment but anyways, my mom had all of her babies at home in her bedroom, so that's how we all came into this world. I was one of her hardest births. I was an 11 pound baby and I was breached, so I did just wanted to do everything I possibly could to not come in this world. I fought it, but she still had me and without a c-section. I don't know how she did it. We also moved a lot. I don't know why, probably something to do with our family growing so fast all the time. But anyways, I was born in this small little apartment, lived there till I was like four years old. And this was the apartment where I had rolled my little tricycle and I had hit my, my face on the bar. I broke my front biggest tooth, like it smashed down and was basically out of my mouth dangling. My mom grabbed me, didn't know what to do with it, so she took the tooth and shoved it 
back into my gums and just left it there and my tooth rotted and I have baby photos of me with a brown blackish tooth that was just rotten and dead but still shoved into my gums. <laughs> I don't know why but that happened in this house. In this house it was also, well this apartment was also the time when me and my sisters went to our neighbor's house and we took dirt globs and like globs of dirt and just threw them inside of our neighbor's window and at one point we snuck in through the window and went into where they had Legos and was like just destroying everything, all of their Legos. We destroyed them but we got caught and we ended up having to go back and I remember sweeping up all the dirt and having to put all the Legos away. I hated it. <laughs> then eventually we moved. We got lucky enough that our well, my grandpa, my mom's dad, ended up helping my family buy a house. I think he just bought the house for us, and so we got to go and live in this house he bought for us. And it was definitely an upgrade, because it's not an apartment anymore. It's a house that had three bedrooms now, whereas our apartment only had two. But we still only had one bathroom, and I think we stayed in this house until there was at least six of us. Six kids, because there was my three sisters and me and three brothers before we moved. So we had... Yeah, four boys in the boys room, three girls in the girls room, and then my mom and dad had their room. Some specific memories I remember from this house was one time I found a pocket knife, like a really cool pocket knife. And it had this cool little button where I just push the button and it fling out. First thing I did when I found this, I ran and showed it to my parents. I was like, mom, look what I found. And she freaked out, showed it to my dad, and my dad was like, oh, let me take this knife, the bad, yada yada, like you can't have knives. And I remember being like, what? It was so cool though. Years later, I found that same pocket knife in one of my dad's like drawers, but I stole it back. So, <laughs> I had a lot of childhood time where I was not really monitored or watched at all. And to be honest, I loved that as a kid. I took full advantage of that. I would get myself in all sorts of craziness. Like, for one thing, when we moved into a house where we actually had a yard, I remember for the longest time, I did not know where our yard started or ended and the neighbors would start. I just thought all of it was ours. <laughs> I thought I could go anywhere and everywhere I wanted to, and I did. I just would roam and get so lost all the time. I do remember my mom telling me multiple times not to go in certain areas and this and that, but I just went in one ear and out the other. I had so much fun. The world was my oyster. Uh, and one thing I did was in the second house that we moved into, the one with three bedrooms, the second house, I don't think. No, this was the third house actually, yeah. The third house that actually had, it had three bedrooms, well then it had something in the basement and it had a laundry room. Anyways, the third house that my family had lived in, this was the house where I became a teenager in. I had gotten an mp3 player at this time in my life and it was the coolest thing in the world. The, the like most advanced technology I had at this time and it meant the world to me and I remember going and downloading music on it and I, the only options I had were music that my other siblings had already downloaded so I went through their list of music that was on the family computer and just picked songs that I thought I would like or whatever and I would go and roam throughout the yards of all of our neighbors and find the tallest tree I could find in the whole neighborhood and I remember climbing it as high as I could and just like sitting down on a branch way up in the sky looking throughout everything throughout the city and all that and I would put my music in and just headbang to scream all like no other <laughs> it was beautiful I loved those moments I'll never forget them I anytime I just needed an escape that's what I would go to go do and so mom all those times where you couldn't find me that's where I was headbanging up in a tall tree <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. I couldn't hear anything. I would drown out the world with my screamo music and just float away in the trees. It was nice. Good times, good memories. And then I'd have to eventually come back to reality and come home. I made the most of it. And like I said, my childhood, probably from like as early as I can remember up to like 11, 12 years old, was honestly a lot of fun. I remember lots of good memories. I remember it being kind of chaotic, but like an enjoyable chaos that I actually liked and just making the most of it and like I said I think kids could 
really, if a kid with a positive mindset and a good attitude was in hell, he would find some way to go, something to do, and to, to have fun and make the most of it. And that's what I believe me and a lot of my siblings did, and what a lot of kids growing up in the cult that I grew up in, what they do. I feel like so many of them just find a way and make the most of it. Now, at least from my personal experience, a lot of this changed once I turned probably 13 or 14 around there because that's when I first got my job that's when a lot more um, burdens were being put on me because there was so much stuff happening so much responsibility given to my mom and different things that she always needed to like give it to the kids and um, you know my dad wasn't taking any of that so it was always on us and I remember this is when it got really horrible because not only are they putting a lot of responsibilities on us because like, like I said, we have good work ethic. Growing up in a polygamous household, you start doing chores from the day you can walk. Like I swear, we had to do all sorts of chores because there's so much stuff to clean up all the time. 24 seven, you're just cleaning up after your own messes. It's chaos, but they do. They put you to work as soon as they can because they, they have to. You have 10 mouths to feed, 10 messes to clean up. You need those 10 people to help out with it. And so we did. We worked all the time. I always had chores growing up. Learned a good work ethic, which I still value to this day. I feel like it's a valuable skill to have. Um, but not only are they putting all of those responsibilities on you, they're also put a lot of pressure on you to believe exactly the way they do. They put a lot of like punishments and rules that if you don't follow or don't live. How did my dad say it? There's some quote he used that I know it's pretty popular, but like as for me in my house we will like serve the Lord or something and he'd always twist that and take that and say like basically we have to believe what he believes otherwise he'll disown us we can't be a part of his family like we don't have that choice if we live in his house he'd always be like well if you don't want to believe my way go live in a shack or live in whatever I don't know where he thought we were gonna go but I would have gladly taken that ticket if there was a real option <laughs> but there wasn't until I turned 18 and then I took it I took my golden ticket out of there but Oh yeah, not only that, so they even, they put all of the, those burdens on you at a very young age, but then they manipulate you even financially. It's not enough to manipulate you with like your dating, your relationships, with your religion, but then they gotta take your finances and literally rip them from you, not teach you how it properly works, not help you to budget or understand. They literally just take it all from you, say everything is the Lord, you don't own anything, nothing is truly yours. All I knew is they wanted me, me to work like a dog, make as much money as I can, and spend near next to none of it if I could <sighs> so yeah that was a lot of stress and this was all happening this started ever since I got a job so from the ages of 14 to 18 when I left this was the kind of chaotic thought process and, and um, burdens that were put on me at least this is my personal experience I know it's different for a lot of people another weird thing about growing up in a polygamous family is that Everyone is so closely related, and I mean like between my dad and my three moms, like between the four of them, we still only had two grandpas and two grandmas, because they were all so closely related. Because the first wife is literally my mom's sister, and the third wife is my dad's sister. So we st when we should have had like, what, six different grandparents? You know? What is it? Well, you know, four different people usually have four different well, grandparents, but we only had uh, two sets of grandparents and growing up that just seemed normal it didn't seem like, like I didn't understand having three grandparents and that was one thing that was like I guess I could relate or similar to with my outside friends only having two grandparents you know that seemed normal and so I didn't notice the difference huh that is really weird actually because I think that's that's definitely unique to my family's polygamous situation because I think most other polygamy families polygamous families probably would have like three sets of grandparents or something like that maybe not in the Kingston group because everyone does marry very closely but you know if the marriages were not so closely related then yeah they would have three or four different sets of grandparents I'm pretty sure I'm doing this right hmm yeah anyways that's weird <laughs> okay and then so eventually we did move again and this move was kind of sad because it was be, our grandpa, my mom's dad, my grandpa, was getting really sick and like um, couldn't live alone anymore. So he had to live in like an old folks home and he eventually ended up living with um, 
the first wife's, one of his other daughters, uh, in their home. And so his house became vac vacant. And somehow my mom and our family was able to live in his house, which was the same. It was like my mom's childhood home or something like that. So I think that's somehow how we were able to live there and how she was able to claim it. And so we got really lucky with that because we essentially kind of in, in a way, a very sad way, got to live, got a house for free in essence, which it was my mom's childhood home. So it makes sense, you know, usually parents give stuff to their kids, but in the order, that's that's not something that's supposed to be allowed. When your parents die, 100% of everything they own goes to the order. And if they're, even if there's sentimental things like, like that, like your childhood home or something you really want from your parents, you would essentially have to buy it back from the order. Those greedy bastards. Yeah, they, they the order teaches everything has to go to the order and then you can try to claim it or, or fight for it or buy it back, whatever. And so somehow my mom just got lucky enough to get it. Don't know exactly how, but that helped us a ton. We were able to finally up get into this bigger home. This home finally had like five rooms in it. It was like a mansion to me. I remember thinking it was just massive and huge, even though now I've, I've gone back and seen it and it's still a pretty small house, but but something that we could have probably never have afforded if it weren't for our, the grandpa that we had that was not an order member, that was on the outside. So we got away with some of that stuff, I guess. I don't know how to explain that, but we got a few nicer things for being such kind of lower class in the order. We got decently nice stuff uh, because of that. But it was really sad because my grandpa did end up passing away when I was like, probably like 11 or 12 around that that time where I could still understand and I remember him giving me every year for my birthday he would give me how old I was I remember getting ten dollars for my birthday one time for my ten-year-old birthday um, and I just thought it was all the money in the world I thought it was so cool and <laughs> this is how long it took me because I remember when I was nine I got nine dollar bills nine dollars from him I remember when I was eight I got eight dollars from him and each of those years I just would run up to my mom and be like look what I got like I have money it's so cool and she would just take it. <laughs> I'd never see it again. And even for my 10th year, I finally was smart enough that I tried to hide it. And eventually she ended up getting it from me and I never saw it again. But, but I mean, like I hope and try to believe that she probably put it in like a savings account for me or, or something. I don't know. I, I trust my mom. I think my mom tried to keep things decently fair, but my dad was a greedy guy. So he definitely took advantage of his kids in a lot of ways. Uh, like he charged us rent from the moment we had jobs he did he tried everything that he could to charge us rent some of us I'll admit got away with it because we fought back and basically had to tell him it was illegal and and put him in his place when he was he didn't give a crap about that he only cared about having money and making sure that we paid our ways he, he I just felt like we never got anything for free you know even the love that we got from him the very few times that I did feel like he loved me it always felt like it came with a price and that's never fun I feel like that's the worst kind of love because it's not real it's always on condition which really sucks but anyways okay something else that comes with growing up in a polygamous family is family meetings you don't understand it like most of growing up but once you become a teenager and like you know they're expecting you to like start getting ready to get married to like be a priesthood holder and do all this stuff then these family meetings are supposed to become like this really big deal and super important stuff like that but I, I don't think that they really were but anyways family meetings were basically where all the families would come together and we would just have this meeting where our dad would like read scriptures and talk about important stuff and then we'd all take a turn bearing our testimony or telling things that the spirit was supposed to tell us but I just remember every time going up standing up in front of all 30 of my siblings and just being like I know this church is true uh, we basically would just say whatever dad said honestly <laughs> I don't know what the point was but part of the brainwashing maybe but anyways yeah family meeting was interesting I watched all my siblings get up in front of us all and just share stuff and we weren't allowed to laugh at them even though sometimes we wanted to really badly um, what else happened in family meetings? I don't know. Family meetings were weird. They just were. But okay, so a little bit about how we got along with the other families, because my family was the second wife family. The the second family is just the middle family, and I feel like personally we got along with all the other families great. 
the kids did wonderful. I feel like I saw them as my own siblings. We played together. I, I loved having more older brothers because I was the oldest boy in the second family. But the other families had other boys older than me. And so I saw them as my older brothers and I loved that. Uh, I thought they were the greatest. I idolized them so much. But there were always quarrels amongst the parents and like the wives specifically because this is because of the living situation you know like they're all sleeping with their man yeah and so they're obviously gonna fight they got into lots of arguments you would have thought that they hated each other's guts but they claim they don't so it's whatever <clears throat> anyways as a kid I feel like I got along with them great I thought they were awesome I loved them we did so many fun things together I don't know, they were the coolest ever there were very few rare times I ever fought with any of them and I did break a couple of the toys. Those were sad days, but other than those, like we got along great. And still to this day, I'm like best friends with all of them. I consider them all my my siblings, and like I love having them. As the kids, we we just know how to get along. We get along great, and it's awesome. The parents, it sucks. Just, just don't do it. Trust me, it's not worth it. Another thing that comes with growing up in a polygamous family, it's just kind of like a package deal is uh, being unrecognized for the most part. I mean, if you're like one of the first child, the first child of one of the wives, then you at least got a little bit of a chance of like standing out or being something different or, or them being noticed and stuff like that. But by the time you're the fourth child of the second family, you don't have any chance. You could be a motherfucking genius, you guys. You could be the smartest kid in, out of all 32 kid siblings and they won't, they won't notice. It's like, you're just one of the many. You're just a part of the herd. Just get used to being with the flock. I think that's why it was kind of like so motivating to become a rebel because you do finally become a little bit of a black sheep until they beat it out of you. <laughs> but um, yeah, for the most part, growing up with so many kids in such big families, with multiple families, then you get really used to just going unrecognized and not really noticed and flying under the radar. That's why I feel like we were able to get away with a lot of stuff. Don't know if I like that, but sometimes it's definitely beneficial in some situations. Sometimes it would have been nice to be noticed. I remember just, you just get used to being called your siblings all the time. If you chose to have me, then at least know who I am, please. Yeah, there were so many times that I got mistaken for other siblings. Is, in fact, there's one of my half siblings from the first wife that looks so much like me that people always called me his name. And all the time, it's not that I was him. And that was kind of interesting. It's kind of like living in the shadow, but I mean, when it came with perks, it was nice and I didn't mind it. But when it's like they were in trouble and I was the one getting the beating for them, then it, it wasn't nice at all. <laughs> Do you guys want to know what the weirdest part about being growing up in a polygamous family is though. Do you guys want to? Do you guys really want to go down that rabbit hole? The weirdest part was anything that had to do with sex. Because my parents were probably having it all the time, but they made it like the weirdest and cringiest and strangest thing ever. Anything related to that. Dating, like talking about it, trying to understand it, learning about it. Like there was even one time, I remember this guy that was trying to court one of my older siblings and I was just like, who the frick are you? Get out of my house. <laughs> like, you're not a part of this family. <laughs> I remember just being so weird when people tried to start coming around because they liked my sisters and just being like, get away. <laughs> I, uh, just anything that had to do with it. It was just so weird. The, uh, the birds and the bees talk, did I tell you guys about how that went for me? Man, it was the most awkward thing. I remember trying to bring it up with my mom because I had heard about it from some of my friends before I even heard about it from any of my parents. And she was just like, we don't talk about those things. Or she would just brush it off. Just so weird to me. I don't know why. Something about standing outside of the door, watch, like, not watching, but you know, being right outside the door when my, my younger siblings were being born and having to bury the placenta or whatever it was. like. I had so many questions and was so curious about it, but my family was just so weird about all of that stuff. And to me, my young brain trying to comprehend it all just couldn't. All of growing up, that was the most foreign, weird, cringe, unknown, like ever. And it was just so weird. 
So weird. I mean, it was as simple as me. I just go to my friends and ask them about it. They would show me like porn or something. I don't know. I figured it out. But I remember my parents just being so dang weird about it. Like, beyond understanding. Like, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know why. But at least for me, that was one of the strangest aspects. Which is weird, because like, I know my parents had sex all the time. They got plenty of kids to prove it. Anyways, enough about that. No, a little bit more, <laughs> actually. Because I just remembered, even the word sex, I remember it was way bad. Oh, and I brushed over what the whole birds and bees talk was with my dad. I remember it wasn't even like he had planned out a time to. I just remember we just happened to be alone together the rare few moments that we were. And he didn't even look at me, but he was just like, have you heard about the birds and bees talk? I remember being like, I had vaguely, but like, I didn't really know what it was, even though I kind of did. But I don't know what to say. Like I said, it was super weird. And he just was like, well, just know that when you do something to your body, a lot of times, then it's not going to be as effective. But if you do it rare, like not too many times or something, then it's better for your body. And now I understand that he was like relating it to masturbation and like, or, or maybe sex too. I don't know, one of those, but saying not to do it too much, but do it like rarely or something like that. Something along those lines. But at the time, that's literally what he said. He compared it to like a train, like a train's engine. Um, uh, what's uh, James, com cha a train's combustion engine or whatever. When you have few holes in it, it works better. But when you poke lots of holes in it, it works less and less. And if you, the more holes you put in it, the less that it works. And so, yeah, that was my birds and bees talk. So at least I got something, because I know a lot of my friends that never had any of the talk. And I got that, but it just confused me more. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't really see what was the point in it. But anyways, even that, like, so that was weird and awkward. But even just saying the word sex, I remember it was like, that was a sin, man. You just, no one says it. Like, I, I'm sure there's so many people from the Kingston group that never say that word. I've had full-on conversations with even my, like, rebel friends in the group where it was like, oh, we were talking about this naughty movie we watched where they had sex in it, but we would never say the word sex. We'd be like, oh, where they, like, did stuff together or they, they had makeup sleepers. <laughs> you would, we would never say makeup sex or just never say sex, ever. It was just something you didn't do. I don't know. It's weird. Even though they, they do it all the time there, it's just they never say the word for some reason. Maybe it makes it less bad <laughs> to sleep with all your cousins when you don't say the word sex, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways. Oh my gosh, you guys. Kids. Let's talk about kids for a minute. So many of them. So many kids, you guys. Growing up in a playmist, I was like, you can't get away from them. You, like, personal time is just not a thing. Even bath time, <laughs> where at least most of my younger years, it was shared. Like, you do not, there's not a thing as privacy. I shared my room with five brothers, you guys. I did not get any privacy. Nothing, nada. Ugh. Growing up in a polygamous family, there are just so many kids and you get so used to it. I don't know how, but you do. You just get used to it, kind of, kind of just because you have to. But yeah, there was a lot of us running around causing chaos and you would either just go in completely insane or you would join the chaos and you know which one I chose <laughs> I added a lot to that chaos and with all those kids along with all those kids comes dirty diapers you guys <laughs> you would not believe how many diapers I have changed in my lifetime and my sisters always laugh at me because my sisters have changed at least 10 times the amount of what I have and it just comes with the gig it's like when you have that many kids in one home in one family it's like you just learn to start raising the next one you like I don't know if our parents like planned this but it was basically our parents teach the oldest kid what to do to teach the next kid and it's just one kid raising the next after the next <laughs> and you just do you, you take on responsibility so fast my oldest sister was tending us ever since she could understand what tending even was she was probably tending us as young as like six years old tending the younger kids and so we were basically all tending ourselves but man it just ugh, it was crazy <laughs> raising ourselves man yeah, that that was a big part of it for sure. Hmm. Okay, well awesome. That's pretty much how I saw it. For me personally, that's my personal perspective of 
growing up in a polygamous family questions, please share them below. I'd love to answer them in my future videos. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you have a good one.